Hi, I'm Martin Sibley, a community leader at Open Inclusion. Welcome to our podcast series, Inclusive Design, Broader Perspectives for Better Experiences. Also available as a captioned video log on Open Inclusion's YouTube channel. Open Inclusion is a research, user insight, design and innovation consultancy based in London, England. We help organizations create beautifully inclusive and effective experiences. If you would like to know more about Open and the work we do, or would like to contact us, please visit openinclusion.com. We would love to hear from you. Now in this podcast series, we're interviewing a wide range of people who help us better understand inclusion, both from a user and service provider perspective. Today, and in the next episode, we're gonna be looking at Purple Tuesday, which is a brand new initiative raising awareness both of the opportunities to the retail industry about the purple pound, which is the 249 billion pounds a year that disabled households spend, and also some of the barriers that are stopping this becoming a reality. So I'm going to be interviewing Judy Fernandez, who's an actress and now disability advocate working all for inclusion about her personal experiences and broader views on the topic. Then we're going to be hearing from Dave Padgton, who basically is an awesome adventuring mountaineering guy, a very, very much a kindred spirit to myself. And he's going to be um, really sharing similar retail experiences, but from his particular disability and his needs. And then we're going to be hearing from Shani Danda, who works for Virgin Media at the moment, but again, really looking and drilling down into her experiences as someone who has short stature. So there's going to be three stories and broader views from disabled people. And then our last guest is also a disabled person. He's the CEO of Purple, who are the organization that have dreamt up this amazing idea of Purple Tuesday and who we're collaborating with on these two podcasts with Open Inclusion. So without further ado, I invite you to get a cup of tea and get everything settled and calm around you and enjoy this episode of Purple Tuesday and Open Inclusion's podcast. So my first guest on the podcast today with Open Inclusion is Julie Fernandez, who someone we've been in touch many times over the years, working together on a radio show a few years back and more recently looking at a few projects with Disability Peterborough. So thank you for joining me today, Julie. Thank you for inviting me. So um, obviously we're all talking things retail today. That's the, the plan for our chat. It'd be great for everyone watching just to give a little a little summary about you know some of the things you've been up to over the years and I just get a bit more of an insight into you. Okay so um, I've been working in the media industry for 26 years now which is a tad scary (laughs) I feel old Um, and during that period um, I also opened a craft shop and teaching centre so I taught patchwork quilting, hand embroidery, crochet etc. Sold that at the beginning of last year um, and carry on working in the media industry hence working with you which is (laughs) fab Um, and I'm the project development manager for uh, an amazing charity in Peterborough called Disability Peterborough and they're a, I can't remember the exact acronym, is it DPO? An organisation that has disabled people at all levels, employed, trustees and it makes such a big difference, it's amazing. So yeah, juggling lots of balls and enjoying it thoroughly. Loving life, (laughs) that's the main thing. Yeah. Great, well so obviously all, all things about Purple Tuesday today. So first off it'd be great just to hear a smoothless positive experience you've had with your needs in mind with with retail if that's okay absolutely i've been having a good old think about that and i was really lucky about 15 years ago i went to live in la for about five six months um to do rounds of auditions and bits and pieces out there um And it was amazing. I lived opposite uh, quite a well-known shopping centre. And because it's America and because it was California, it was all just utterly seamless. It was beautiful. It was ramps everywhere. There was... Uh, you know every clothes shop had a large changing room I never had to wait for because an able-bodied person had gone in there because the rest of the cubicles were booked Uh, you know it was it was great and that for me and this sounds really boring 
but but actually what i want is can be seen as really boring as as a customer i just want to have a seamless easy experience i want to mm. be able to get in okay i want to be able to get around the shop okay without there being lots of boxes and bits all around the shop floor you know i, I want to know that there's a disabled changing room i can change in that when i um go to buy the item and i'm paying for it that the person serving me will deal with me, not my PA or my husband or the able-bodied or non-disabled person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it right. <laughs> um, that's with me. Yeah. Um, you know, talk to me, react to me. I, I don't ignore the person with me, but don't have that entire conversation and hand the product back to the able-bodied, non-disabled person with me. God, you can see I'm old, can't you? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it sounds boring, but I just want an easy experience. I don't want to have to explain myself. I don't want to have to worry about whether I can get in and get round and go, oops, sorry, oh, excuse me, oh, do you mind if I... It's really as simple as that. Yeah, no, that sounds great. As you say, it it sounds boring because it's like how just life should be, that everyday boring <laughs> inverted commas life, but it's something that we all are still striving for. So, I mean, lo looking at... Obviously, by going through that seamless experience, you're still touching upon the, the areas that are generally not always okay and not always accessible. So for you, what, what are some of the main barriers you face and how does that affect you with your shopping experience? Oh, the main barriers I face, I think pretty much every wheelchair user faces and, and different disabilities face different needs and barriers. So I can talk about it predominantly from my own experiences. And that's the, the can I physically get in the shop? Are there steps? Is there a lift? Can I get round? Is it practical? Can I reach the cash machine for the card machine? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, really the built environment and the fact that everything's too high or isn't accessible to me it's more that and and the staff's attitude so it's great when you come across a, a member of staff in whichever business you're going into um who is great in dealing with a disabled customer um, and they're usually people in my experience who have someone in their family or circle mm. of friends so they're just comfortable it's not an issue they're not worried about um, saying the wrong thing or feeling awkward it's just natural to them so it's a bit of built environment and it's a bit of people's attitudes really yeah. which is yeah. a social model of disability yeah. it's strange because you know i was born with my disability and i've never in my life seen it as a negative thing ever it's part of who i am you know my whole career is built on the fact that i have a disability i think i'm very lucky it's actually the lack of built environment and people's attitudes that i find more disabling if you like than my disability which i know how to manage yeah no it's a really good point to make. and then you know great life changes for the better absolutely and i mean you and i have been talking about the social model of disability for a long while and it it yeah. can sound like we're sort of repeating ourselves but i mean every day i meet new people particularly of of the sort of industry side and the non-disabled side that aren't familiar with it and it's a lovely lens to realize that we're disabled by barriers not disabled by our medical impairment or whatever other words you want to associate to it so yeah yeah then obviously look into solutions as well as you talked about built environment i suppose is more intuitive about you know if there's steps let's have a ramp or a lift or that sort of stuff but i'd be interested in your thoughts on the attitudinal side and inclusive customer service what i mean have you yeah basically what do you think about how we can try and help customer service people to be more aware can we just backtrack to the first point, though, because um, <clears throat> about the built environment. Sure. Uh, when Part M 
came out years ago, about 15, 16 years ago, part of the DDA, which was all about access to goods and services. <clears throat> I went with about six or seven British journalists for a few days uh, around London, tourist attractions, interesting places, um, to have a look at what the access was like or, or, or actually how, in those days, how rubbish it was, because it has got better. Yeah. It really has. Transport's got better. All of it's got better. But too slowly it needs to have been in my opinion much further ahead however those journalists and i then decamped over to san francisco for four days okay now the ada was passed about 10 15 years before the the english version and it was fascinating because um what we noticed the able-bodied journalists and the disabled journalists was that in in that area around san francisco wherever there were steps there was a ramp mm -hmm. wherever there was a cash machine there was a high one and a low one um all the electric doors into buildings had you know the push handles mm -hmm. um to to get you in they had handheld height and a footplate height version mm -hmm. same in lift same you know etc what we all started because we some there were times when we would just sit and watch how people reacted and, and what we noticed was the vast majority of able-bodied people would choose to walk the ramp rather than the steps they chose the low cash point machine before they went to the high cash point machine they went to the lower service counters in in shops and businesses more than they did the high ones so it started to get everyone in in who was with us the journalists to think about it in that actually it every it helps everybody mm. so um yes we might think we're doing it just for disabled people making these adaptions but we're not we're making it easier for millions and millions and millions of people that's really and that good, becomes yeah. really obvious when you can sit back and watch the differences and where the choices are yeah but that was a long time ago <laughs> um, in terms of service mm, that's that's a tricky one because service is all about the individual member of staff's attitude towards disability mm. in part. Okay. It will be about how confident they are as an individual. Some people are really shy. They might feel awkward. Um, but uh, what a lot of businesses can do is there are exceptional trainers out there, yourself, Mick Scarlett, myself. There's loads of us that do really intuitive, interesting disability equality training for staff members for businesses in a way that makes um, the non-disabled people that are coming on that course feel very comfortable yeah. able-bodied people tend to feel really awkward around disabled people for mm -hmm. fear of for example and i'm sure you get this you can see people don't know whether to bend down when they talk to oh, you yeah. when you're in your chair or not for <laughs> example i get that it hurts their knees uh, for example their brain's like oh my god oh my god will i offend that person won't i you know all of these things so most people aren't doing it on purpose then most people aren't doing it to be unkind they they just feel so awkward and they don't want to um do anything wrong say anything wrong so good equality training is paramount yeah no i absolutely agree with that and having members of staff who are disabled the minute um people around you on a regular basis are black people gay people disabled people whatever you want whatever minority group you realize very quickly we've all got red blood in our veins you know we're we all need to eat we all need to pay the bills we're all human that's it yeah that's been a big thing for me this year is that we can you know all of our little sort of worlds and our little missions we get very stuck and focus on one thing but in the end you know inclusion is just not leaving anyone out not excluding anyone and in the end it, it all comes back to that open-mindedness and awareness for for including everyone both as customers but also as employers and all the rest of it yeah. absolutely and, and let's face it as well you know for years uh, we've been those of us working in the media industry have been talking to businesses for years and years and years about why they should make themselves accessible to customers with who have a disability um and for years we had to talk about it because in such a way that it was the right thing to do you know 
uh, it's the empathic thing to do, it's the compassionate thing to do. Um, now we can talk about it in terms of lots and lots of money. Mm. So the collective spending power, as we know, the purple pound in the UK is 249 billion. Worldwide, it's 1.3 trillion. It's a lot of cash. That's a huge amount of cash. I've run a business, I've owned a business and I run a business. I don't want to turn away any customer that wants to come through the, the, my door and spend their money. I don't care where you come from, what you do, who you are. If you want to come in and spend your money, come and spend your money, that's fine. That's what businesses need to think about. Mm. Um, and in this day and age, it's all about the bottom dollar. It's about your profit, you know, how much money can you make, which in itself is another conversation. But um, I don't quite get how businesses still can't turn themselves around and realize that they need to be tapping into 249 billion. Yeah, it's a yeah. huge customer market base. And that's uh, absolutely and they perfect. Get over themselves. <laughs> and that's exactly the point we're trying to make with this podcast and with Purple Tuesday. So hopefully there will be lots of people, retail people, signing up and uh, taking those steps forward, as you say, reaping the benefits as well. Yeah, we, we, we disabled people, we still need to dress ourselves, we still need to feed ourselves, we still want to go to the cinema, you know, we, we're not just at home, penniless, poor, and there are a lot of disabled people who are living on benefits, but they still need to dress themselves, they still mm. need to feed themselves, they still want a social life. Yeah. Why don't you want my money? <laughs> Simple, really. Julie, it's a pleasure, as always, to talk with you. Thank and you for those amazing insights. <laughs> and we'll talk again soon, yeah? All right. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Well, that was a really interesting interview we just had with Julie Fernandez talking all about her experiences. My next guest is David Padkin, who is dialing in from uh, Derbyshire. And uh, we've had a few, for those watching the vodcast on YouTube, we've had a few camera tech difficulties but we've uh, we've found a workaround and for those listening to the audio version that's all irrelevant to you anyway um, but the main thing is that we're going to get to have a good chat about Dave's experiences so before we get into the nitty-gritty of retail Dave it'd be great just to, to hear a bit about yourself and really particularly about your amazing achievements with the Paralympics and the, the mountain trekking as well if that's okay. Uh, yeah that, uh, that... Uh, uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, uh, now I'm uh, Dave. Uh, uh, now I uh, uh, was born with cerebral palsy, and uh, I had a ten-year career as a, an international athlete, uh, uh, competing in uh, Barcelona and Atlanta Paralympic Games in. 1992 and 1996. I uh, also competed for Great Britain in two World Championships and European Championships and World Games as well. Uh, I, after retiring from sport, I took up my other great passion, which is mountaineering and adventures. So I was the first European with cerebral palsy to climb Kilimanjaro and then I was the first first disabled person to uh, to do a multi south traverse of a mountain called Mount Elbrus, which is the highest mountain in Europe. It, it's in the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia, uh, very close to the border between Russia and Georgia. Uh, 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 so they are, those two are the two biggest uh, mountain ring achievements that I've got to date. Wow, amazing, amazing achievements there, Dave. And so, I mean, moving things on to our topic on the podcast today around retail. As, as we're doing with all of the interviews on this episode, it'd be great really just to, to hear about when retail worked well for you, where there was, you know, no problems and it was just a seamless, happy, positive experience. 
the first one comes not not from the a shopping experience experience per se uh, but in a restaurant in Egypt I uh, uh, I was on holiday uh, and went to this restaurant uh, and ordered my meal and uh, uh, the meal came and I asked for a spoon a dessert spoon because I sometimes struggle a bit with forks and shoveling food in my mouth with, with a fork, it often falls off, so the spoon is easier for me. So, uh, so, so the waiter went away, came back a few minutes later with a spoon, no problem, brilliant, thank you very much. Wow. I, I went back to the same restaurant three days later uh, and we ordered another meal uh, and the wait brought the spoon with the meal. I didn't have to ask for it because he remembered me. Um, he remembered that, 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 that was something that I needed to enjoy my meal. Me. So uh, that, that's a really positive experience of customer service. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the other uh, area of that is uh, uh, that. Uh, Something we might go back to a bit later is um, uh, 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 generally by and large uh, the staff in the outdoor industry in uh, outdoor shops that are, that are very progressive and very liberated in their attitudes. And I've had countless experiences of, of really positive uh, uh, engagement with staff in outdoor shops and outdoor environments like that. Uh, uh, no, it's only about that industry, that part of the industry, that is very positive and very liberated. Yeah, sure. No, it's great. And I know, as you said, we'll, we'll come back to that industry a little bit later with some of the, you know, potential friction points. I know you've got one particular example, but it's great to hear that broadly the outdoor shopping experience has been you know, a good one. I know that you also had mentioned when we were chatting earlier around that the online shopping is also quite flawless and positive for you. Do you want, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Uh, I, yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, I have uh, started using online shopping platforms like, uh, like Amazon. Uh, uh, much more frequently, much more regularly, uh, 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 principally because uh, I can uh, uh, find what I want, order it, buy it, and not have to have any engagement with somebody who's got some preconceptions about me and about my uh, 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 wants and desires. And so uh, uh, if I shop on Amazon, it, it, it means I don't have to go to a shop and get patronised by five sales assistants. Yeah, yeah, which, you know, is it's terrible that that still happens, but I think that's partly why we are raising awareness today that whilst it's great that there is online shopping and so with your you know, particular situation, that actually works quite well, mm -hmm. I'm sure you also do like to go to you know actual shops in person and shouldn't have to undergo the the patronizing and you know, generally negative uh, customer service that you have sometimes experienced so i suppose moving on into the the barriers and and the areas that you would love to be improved for the future and for any of the retail industry watching or listening they they can you know learn from you as well um what would you say are areas that you have struggled with and would like to see improved upon? It's really about providing good customer care and uh, 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 speaking to the customer at, at an appropriate level. Uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, to, 
to these uncles and but uh, 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 again in, in uh, the outdoor industry uh, uh, I I uh, you used to go shopping with a friend of mine and uh, uh, I'd go go to a shop and I'd be looking for something very specific uh, I'd speak to the sales assistant uh, uh, um, and ask a question about the item I was interested in and by and large they, they would frequently address their answer to, to my mate and not to me mm. uh, 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 so the, I asked the question and they uh, answer to uh, uh, Adam, my friend. Uh, uh, to, uh, he was very astute uh, and he would wait until they were about halfway through their answer and then he'd just walk away <laughs> and, uh, 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 and abandon the sales assistant to, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to continue giving their answer to me. And, uh, uh, but that was always quite entertaining, although it's a situation that should never happen. Sure, I know. Yes. And I think, you know, we as disabled people, we do use humour, you know, to, to break down barriers and to actually just cope with some of these situations. But as we've said a few times, you know, that that is not how customer service should be. So I think um, we'll, we'll draw the interview to a close in a moment, Dave. We're uh, you know trying to get through them in around the ten minute mark, but uh, I think really what I've taken away and what everyone listening and watching has taken away is that for you really customer service is key, and that whilst the stuff that goes on is really terrible and the way it impacts your life and your ability to be a, a customer, the the solutions as we are learning more and more don't have to be that complicated or expensive. It's actually just about educating the staff and then taking the time to understand the customer's needs without making presumptions. I mean, is that sort of roughly what you would, would agree with? Is there any other thoughts you have on the solution? Well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 that, that, that was pretty much it. Uh, 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 I want to be confident about going go to a shop and uh, uh, having a positive uh, and engaging shopping experience with staff that are actually helpful uh, and are enthusiastic as well as knowing what their market is. Uh, 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 so the uh, I want to feel confident about going into a retail environment and uh, having an intelligent conversation with somebody who respects my, my level of intelligence, uh, yeah. if that's not too pompous a thing to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that sounds very, very familiar to me and, and lots of other people listening. And also, really, thank you for sharing your experiences and your story, because I'm sure it's going to help retailers learn to get it right in the future as well. Well, uh, well, thank you very much indeed for, for listening to me. So our next interview is with Shani Danda, who is from Diversibility Card, and we'll be hearing a bit more about that in a moment. And in this interview, we're going to be covering Shani's experiences of retail, um, particularly looking at some good stuff, but also highlighting the barriers that still exist today and what needs to be done more to overcome them for the future. So uh, thank you for joining me today, Shani. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here. And so yeah, it'd be great just to give a very quick, you know, history and intro so people know a bit more about you and then we'll, we'll obviously move into the retail side. Sure, sure. So um, I'm a very proud Brummie now living here in London um, and I've been an event manager for the last 10 years and I'm now, um, a project manager um, within the disability space. So I'm currently working with Virgin Media um, to help transform the experiences for their disabled uh, customers and employees. And I've also launched um, the Diversibility Card, which is a discount card for disabled people, um, because as we all know, disabled people face unavoidable extra costs due to living with um, a health 
condition. Um, and I guess I'm at the stage where I'm now talking to retailers, getting retailers signed up because I can really see the benefit uh, of, of not only appreciating their current customers that may have conditions or impairments, but also attracting new ones too, due to the market value of the per pound. Yeah, then that's something that's just going to keep coming up again and again, the interviews at that, the potential of the spending power of disabled people is massive, that it's really a no-brainer for retail to, to be involved. Um, so just to illustrate to, to any of the retail people watching, what is it when you go shopping, and it could be online, it could be in a you know high street, what, what have you had as a good experience when things just worked well for you? So um, due to my condition, I have a short stature of three foot 10. So as you can imagine, um, you know, I live in a world that really isn't designed for me. But having said that, I still have had some brilliant retail experiences. And some of those are um, when I have been into to stores on high street and the layout has been really good. So um, let me just start with, with the beginning. So a trolley with wheels that changes my entire experience because I can't carry a lot of items just you you know if my basket's heavy then that means I'm going to buy less um, and I, I often face that when I go to supermarkets as well so I love accessible trolleys they're much they're much lower in height it means I can also see over the trolley as well um, so yeah definitely uh, basket baskets with wheels and, and accessible trolleys are a win um, for me um, and there's one retailer which I particularly love for their layer and that's TK Maxx mm -hmm. um, so as I've mentioned I'm three foot ten so that means that I have to adapt a lot of my clothes um, and what it means is that I can I can go to TK Maxx they say they say they're great array of brands it means I can still be stylish and I haven't spent a lot of money to, to buy something just to cut half of it up um, but what I also really love about TK Maxx is a lot of their um, clothing are, are on low rails. So there's not really many stores that I've been to of theirs where things are really high. And I totally get like, you know, I don't, I don't need the world to suddenly adjust and for everything to be on my level because I know that's obviously not going to happen. But a bit, a bit of consideration can really go a long way. Um, and, you know, Therefore, I love TK Maxx. I shop there all the time. They, I'm definitely brand loyal to them. Um, and I share that, share that knowledge with my friends who may be in the same position as me, with my family, um, because for me, it ticks all of the boxes. And, you know, just to come back to your, to your point about the bag of pound, it's not only my pound that they, they, they're getting, it's all of my friends, my family. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely something that retailers should should be opening their eyes to that's amazing so you've touched on a few really interesting points there there's obviously the the layout of the shop at tk max and in particular from your experience um is really really suitable for your needs but yeah. then the benefits are the not just your spending power but it's yeah. that of the people the word of mouth that you're going to tell others and that whole well, oh, that whole ingredient is just really powerful, isn't it? That, you know, <laughs> you're not feeling like a pain or that you're, you're having to go and get special particular things just because of your short stature. It's that you can go to a high street shop and have everything you want like someone else does, but it's just yeah. all seamless and smooth, which is brilliant. Yeah, and you know, it can be, it can really be disheartening when you have to spend most of your time in a shop trying to find somebody to get something down for you. Um, you know, we all know how, how busy staff are in retail stores, so sometimes you can feel like you're disrupting them from what they're doing, or sometimes I have to scan, you know, other shoppers and think, oh, who's actually approachable here that I can ask for them to get me my size down or something. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it can really transform a shopping experience. Um, and also, I'm a massive online shopper. You know, when online shopping came about, it really it really changed my life. Um, not so good for my bank balance, but um, yeah, it, it, it's been life-changing. Um, and it's just enabled me to, to be more productive as well because if I don't fancy going out, I, I know I can just do a few clicks on the on the computer and I've got my 
my items the next day. So that's that's also equally yeah. um, brilliant. And I'd imagine with the online experience that from your personal perspective, that whole process is pretty accessible in terms of the, the being able to, to buy and to, to read about everything, all that sort of stuff, obviously, because there are going to be other disabled people, it's a visual impairment where there's more to think about. But I'd imagine it's the product. I mean, you mentioned clothing. I know that mm-hmm. it's something that's so difficult. For, for many people with short stature and people like myself who yeah. use wheelchairs uh, to have like comfortable and fitting clothes. So I suppose online, yeah. it's about having the range of products available there that are both stylish and cool, but suitable and, and accessible as well. Absolutely. And I just wanted to sort of call out as well, like a free returns process. Mm. So I buy and also return um, a lot of clothes because if something if I buy something and it actually doesn't suit me or it's not maybe worth cutting half of it up to tailor it then I want the option to return it but I don't want to have to pay to do that yeah. so that's again another barrier that's that some retailers put up um, so that there's loads that I could mention um, that have free returns policies I also really love ASOS it's it's seamless and I can get my items the next day. Uh, I wish it could be same day. Uh, but yeah, a free returns policy as well is, is really helpful. Cool. So, you know, obviously we've, we've definitely covered the positive experience. And I think actually the, the friction points and the barriers, they, they come through, don't they? Because it's the reason that you're having when you have good experiences is because those friction points have, not, uh, have been thought of. I mean, just yeah. a, have you got any couple of thoughts on what it means to you when things aren't accessible? You know, that, like both how that how makes you feel, but also just the broader reality of not being able to buy something when you would have otherwise done it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always um, explain like living with a condition or an impairment is like having a full time job. And when we think about everyday experiences, yes, that includes shopping, whether that's for food or for clothing or whatever. And I just want to be able to have a seamless process. I don't want to have to face barrier after barrier in doing that when I face so many other barriers in other parts of my life, Mm -hmm. just going about things every day. Um, And obviously, depending on my mood on that day as well, it can really, you know, set you up for a bad day. and of course, everybody just wants a really positive shopping experience. And as I've already mentioned, it, it can make the difference of me spending my money there, as well as all of my wider network. So I think, um, you know, it can definitely, it can definitely change my mood personally. Um, and I might then relay that to others. So then, you know, that reputation uh issue might come in too um so yeah i think it's just about understanding the broader issue that that disabled people face as a whole just going about their lives as well yeah and then i suppose in terms of solutions it's really about retailers listening or talking to and listening to disabled people about those needs because no one can read minds and also they're not feeling that it all has to happen today but it, you know, it's a process and it can take a while, which I know you do in your job at Virgin Media. It's about the vision and, and moving one step at a time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as businesses, there are so many priorities. Um, but I think that once retailers have absolutely stood, understood the, the value of the Purple Pound and actually the, the needs of their customers, but not only the needs, but the demand for their services or goods. Um, I just really want retailers to be to be bold, just to start somewhere. And once you've started somewhere, you're on that journey. You know, we understand that things can't change overnight. We have to allocate budget to certain things. But some of the changes can be really quick fixes. Um, and of course, then, you know, there'll be other longer term programs that might take a bit longer, longer to transform. Um, but as long as retailers have the courage to start somewhere and to be bold. Um, I think that's a massive, massive step in the right direction. Yeah, well said, Sandy. I love that. That's really cool. Well, thank you for your time today. Obviously, good luck with all your work and your projects. Um, people can presumably get in touch with you at 
diversibility card online, right? Absolutely, yeah. All my personal handles is Shani Danda on all platforms. Great, and we'll uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. So we've had some really good stories from Julie, Shani and Dave all about their experiences of food retail and obviously some of the, the barriers that they still face today and that we, we're all trying to work hard to overcome. So now I'm joined by Mike Adams, who's CEO of Purple. Thank you for joining me today as well, Mike. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it would uh, just be great to hear all about Purple Tuesday, which is the, the whole topic of these two episodes of the open podcast just really you know work, work from your personal perspective but also purple's perspective why this has been such an amazing idea thank you martin and uh so purple tuesday is the uk's first accessible shopping day that's going to take place on the 13th of november and in many ways it stems from what purple is about which is talking to both disabled people and to businesses about the value of disability. And in terms of Purple Tuesday, it links very much to raising awareness of the Purple Pound, the £249 billion consumer spending power of disabled people and families. Mm -hmm. Yet we know that less than 10% of businesses have a targeted strategy to access that market. We know that 75% of disabled people have either left a shop or website due to poor customer service um, or access. And we know that disabled people as a demographic have the highest level of brand loyalty. So Purple Tuesday is a call to action to retail to think about the power of disabled consumers and their family and do something about it that is more than just about one day. It's about what they're going to do for the next year. Yeah, yeah. So it's a longer term. It's not just that one day. It's looking to the future. I mean, I think one thing for everyone watching or listening to the podcast, whether they're disabled or they're in retail, what sort of actions are they able to try and take with you to this day and beyond? Well, in terms of uh, retail, and just by retail, we mean retail outlets, we mean shopping centres, and we mean landlords of shopping centres. What we're asking them to do is make a pledge around something that they have not done before, or formalise something that they are doing. So quiet hours, for example, um, it may be to instigate regular quiet hours it could be a commitment to look at wayfaring it could be a commitment to introduce uh, disability awareness training for all staff customer service training it could be about if you do mystery shopping to ensure that disabled people are part of your mystery shoppers we're asking retailers to make a commitment and to honor that commitment uh, for the following year I guess there's a big misconception often in this world that to be inclusive is always going to cost loads and loads of money and lots and lots of time. But some of the things you were saying there are not particularly expensive. It's just about being aware and having that, those things built into your strategy. Absolutely. And one of the things we have created as a resource for the retailers who are participating is a short handy hints customer service guide called hello can i help you mm -hmm. and actually martin that costs absolutely nothing yeah. but it's incredibly difficult or it's perceived to be really incredibly difficult to deliver because not because frontline staff are um, prejudiced against disabled people but there's a, a fear of unintentionally offending a disabled person through language and etiquette. And actually the default position is to avoid the conversation. Yeah. And we are yeah. saying, hello, can I help you? Breaks the ice. It is that first conversation that actually is about good customer service. And we're saying, apply that to disabled customers. Yeah. 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 And so we mentioned about with the disabled people's side of this that 
are there, are there any ways that they can sign up and take actions for the day or is it only sort of looking towards retail? No, absolutely. This is, you know, I I am rooted in the nothing about us without us kind of mantra. Um, and if we're going to transform the shopping experience for disabled people, then the experience, the lived experiences of disabled people are, are critical. And, and in the next seven days, what you'll see on the purpletuesday.org.uk website is a document how to be involved, disabled people and their representative organisations. And there's a call to action there that says, look, there's a suggestion box. Um, and what we want to know is from disabled people, positive experiences of shopping, whether it's in store or online, and, and what made it a positive experience. And then, where there were challenges, where there were difficulties, in an anonymised way, because this is about carrots, not sticks, what were the issues? And if you put yourself in the shoes of the store manager, what are the solutions that would have transformed that difficult issue into a positive one? Yeah. And yeah. therefore, what we're going to do is, as a product after Purple Tuesday, is collate disabled people's and their representatives thoughts about what is good practice what does that look like what does that feel like what is practice that exists that needs to be eradicated but what are the solutions and that will be a resource that goes across the uk to all retailers so by the time we get to purple tuesday 2 next year disabled people would have had a real influence on day-to-day -day practice of retailers that's amazing. Well, congratulations because I'm excited just hearing you talk about it and obviously looking forward to seeing everyone sign up. We'll obviously put the links on below the podcast so people can, can click through and, and help to, to get involved and take action. And um, yeah, just really thanks for your time and good luck with everything, Mike. Thank you very much. Well, that's been a real whistle-stop tour, hasn't it? Um, I think really it's interesting how through all those different people's stories, including Mike's as well, it really, really just kept bringing up those three areas of barriers all under the social model of disability, which are the environmental barriers, the attitudinal barriers, and the procedural barriers. And when they are non-existent, a person isn't disabled, and they're having the perfect retail experience that they would always want to have. And as um, it was said a couple of times as well, it's almost a boring aim because it just seems so simple and undramatic, but it's actually the holy grail for all disabled people. Conversely, when any of those barriers are at play, it affects people on a very personal and emotional level. And that's always been the argument that we should really do it, do the right thing and, and be compassionate and the moral thing. But what's coming out more and more now is the economic benefits of inclusion and when we look at that 249 billion pound spending power it actually is just crazy that lots of businesses aren't aware of this and aren't doing more to be inclusive but that's why it's exciting that we're all able to work together to bring you this podcast and share these insights and invite you to to join in purple tuesday and to join in the bigger movement that we're all pushing forward and really to keep pushing more and more for an uh, open and inclusive world. So thank you for watching this episode. And of course, our next episode is also about Purple Tuesday, where we'll be hearing from industry side of retail and some examples of um, where they've managed to really find the passion, but also the actions and the outcomes that have really benefited their business from being inclusive. So I hope you're going to enjoy that and tune in for that next time. And in the meantime, take care and see you soon. Bye-bye.